Good evening. Is everybody? Yeah. My name is Amni von Wedel, and I'm co-founder of Intelligence Squared Asia, together with Jana Peel. It's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you this evening on behalf of our team. I would like to start with a big thank you to our speakers, some of whom have flown in especially for this battle of wit and wisdom. And also a big thank you to all of you for being here tonight. We know it's a very busy week. Today marks our third annual art debate during Art Hong Kong, and it's the eighth overall debate in Asia. Over the years, it's been a pleasure and a privilege aligning our efforts to cultivate a deeper conversation about art and ideas alongside Magnus and the fair. The energy that fuels Hong Kong is so largely driven by creativity and commerce as its gateway to Asia. And with its constitutional to commitment to freedom of expression, Hong Kong is also a gateway to a very important dialogue that must exist if art and artists, beautiful and otherwise, are to grow and prosper in the region. It's very rewarding to see how Hong Kong has embraced our forum for live debate. And we very much hope that you will join us again in October when we return to the Hong Kong Convention Center alongside our friends at Deutsche Bank to discuss whether money can or cannot buy happiness. <laughs> and if anyone's unsure, I think this is a great week to test it out. <laughs> the overwhelming support and enthusiasm for tonight's debate, Art Must Be Beautiful, is in large part thanks to the efforts of our amazing team, Alexandra Seno, our executive producer, Stephanie Poon and her tireless team of interns, and the invaluable Sumay Thompson as our advisor. It's also a testament to the longstanding support of our tar partnership with Deutsche Bank, who extend their commitment to art and excellence by supporting our nonprofit efforts in bringing challenging and creative dialogue to the region. We are very thankful to our media partners, International Herald Tribune, Time Out and Ogilvy, and to the very generous community of journalists who has been so supportive in enabling our effort to grow. Thanks also to Upper House for accommodating our guests in such fabulous style, and to all of you for making it here this evening on such a busy time. Without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Lars Nitva, Executive Director of M Plus at the West Kowloon Cultural District, who will be our distinguished and delightful moderator for the evening. I'm not so sure about these D words, but uh, anyway, I'll give it a shot. Thank you, Jana. <clears throat> well, uh, as you know, the motion for tonight is art must be beautiful. Uh, you may or may not know that this is half of a title by work by Marina Abramovich from 1975, which actually says art must be beautiful. Artists must be beautiful as well. And some artists around at this table have actually followed that rule also and <laughs> appreciate that very much. Um, in this piece, Marina Abramovich is a really haunting, haunting work, video work, where she combs her hair and she says, art must be beautiful, artists must be beautiful, and more and more aggressively. It's a fantastic work. Look at it. It's on, actually, you can find it on, on YouTube. Um, of course, art must be beautiful raises a lot of questions. Can aesthetic standards of the day dictate the long-term value of art? Are the aesthetic standards ever eternal? And if there is an essential beauty, if so, is that good, etc., etc., etc. I mean, this question, this motion, sort of, of course, raises uh, an enormous number of questions. And, and uh, uh, I'm sure some of them will be raised here in this debate. And uh, I'm sure many others as well. And in due time, of course, you will also have the chance to, to ask questions or uh, put forward your opinions uh, in, to the question, art must be beautiful, or the motion, rather. Um, some of you, I'm sure, know how this is, how this is uh, the process of an intelligence square discussion. Um, you have... Uh, been given a question, uh, your view on the motion when you came in, there's been a poll, and uh, towards the end of the debate when you've heard uh, 
the various views on these questions for and against, you will get a chance to vote uh, also in, on your view on uh, whether art must be beautiful. And of course, I will compare the results with what happened, what was your view when you came in, and what is your view when you go out. So how successful has either party, those who are arguing for or been arguing against, been in their putting forward their, their views and arguments? And that's going to be really, really exciting. Uh, I'll say this already now. I'll instruct you already now as how you vote. You have in your bags, the bags you've received, you have a card like this. Red and white. <laughs> Check it so you, you haven't, so you haven't missed it or mislaid it or it's fallen out of your bag. This is super important. <laughs> and uh, towards the end of the debate, after you've heard the, 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 ver the various arguments for and against, there will be red boxes circled around among you and you'll be able to vote. And of course what you do is that you tear this apart and you put the one you think you want to, the vote you want to put into the box if you're for or you're against. If you by any chance, and I don't recommend that really, if you by any chance you don't know, after having heard these fantastic presentations, I don't know how that can happen, but if that's the case, you put the whole card. But we, we don't want to see that really. We want clarity. Um, we actually have the results for the entry poll. We had 507 um, votes. I'm sure you're more than 507. Some of you have not voted. That's quite clear. Uh, but uh, of the 507, uh, 90 were undecided, which was a bit depressing, but uh, <laughs> there you go. You had 136 for saying that, yes, art must be beautiful. But you had 281 saying, no, art must not be beautiful. Or saying no to that motion, I should say. We'll see where we land. So we had 136 for, 281 against, and 90 undecided. Waiting for the debate, of course, the undecided one waits especially. Um, my expectation, of course, from this uh, debate, uh, and when I will cast the vote at the end of the evening, uh, I think what I will keep in mind is uh, how my position in the important debate already from the 18th century about the, the beautiful and sublime, how that has uh, the result of that. I expect that that will address, be addressed thoroughly by this illustrious pan panel. So we will hear about Edmund Burke's view about uh, his, their views on uh, a f a philosophical inquiry into the, the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful from 1756, for example, or Kant's discourse of the sublime and beautiful. I hope that will be clear where you stand in these issues towards the end of the debate, because <laughs> um, that's going to steer my vote. Personally, I'm all for uh, the sublime, but uh, who cares about what I think? <coughs> we have four eminent uh, panelists to bat who bat will battle this question out. Art must be beautiful. For the motion, we have David LaChapelle. I almost... It really holds true for all panelists that they almost don't need a presentation and you have a pretty good presentation also in this bag that you now have found. Uh, but David LaChapelle is of course one of the great photographers of our time and also he knows a lot about beauty given the f incredibly beautiful people he has photographed over the years. Uh, I l really look forward to hearing his views on beauty. Uh, for the motion also we have Simone de Puri co-founder of uh, Philips de Paris Auction House, and I've been told, I haven't seen this actually, a mentor in the hit US reality uh, TV program, Work of Art, the next great artist. 
uh, we may hear something about this as well. But of course, Simone has worked with some of the great museums in, in Europe and then also with, auction, with one of the great auction houses and seen so many beautiful things passing through his hands. Against the motion, we have to my, my far left, your far right, Ming Wong, who's an award-winning multimedia artist from Singapore, who of course, uh, and I think especially about a work called Life and Death in Venice, uh, which was really about uh, the film, and or relating to the film Death in Venice, the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful films in the world. Uh, he has of course reflected in many of his works on uh, the issue on, and the question of beauty. And when I talk about death in Venice, we talked about that outside actually, I mentioned him, I was a classmate or schoolmate at least with Bjorn Andresen who played the beautiful young boy in the film Death in Venice. And uh, he was named after that film the most beautiful boy in the world, which I must say, beauty totally ruined his life. <laughs> he could never really handle life after that. It was a pretty scary thought aspect of beauty. I also, against the motion, is Stephen Bailey, author of Women in Design and a former director of uh, the Design Museum, actually the first director and founding director of the Design Museum, and of course, a very prolific author and, and, and curator and many other things. Also, he seems forever have to live with the, the title the second smartest man in Britain. <laughs> if I'm not misremembered, uh, and I might misremember, he was also named the most well-dressed man in England at some point, because I remember when I met him the first time, I think in the year 2000 or so in, in London, I was so proud that I had a similar suit to his, a beautiful window pane suit, beautiful. Uh, the order for the debate is the following, and of course this has done, been done under uh, severe control of all the sort of anti-corruption authorities of Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, David LaChapelle starts for the motion, he's followed by Ming Wong against the motion, then um, Simon de Puy is for the motion, and then Stephen Bailey will talk again against the motion. Each speaker can speak for 10 minutes. I've been told I will be given a glass that I can cling when the time is out. I might make some other noises, we'll see which, <laughs> when the time is out. Uh, and um, at some point then, after the speeches, we will have also, uh, we will do the voting. Then after, after the talks, the first presentations, they will, we will also open the floor to questions and proposals and what not to, to the panel. So I should just grab my some sort of timekeeping instrument here. Uh, so David, yes. are you ready? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. You have 10 minutes ahead talking for the motion. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Thank you. And you are, yes, and you should, uh, you're asked to be at the podium. Oh. When you do that. Sorry, I okay. should have instructed you about that. Okay. No problem. Is that all right? Yes, mm. of course. This is your only chance to use the podium, by the way. <laughs> Gosh. A little nerve wracking, but. Um, must art be beautiful? Um, no, but it helps. <laughs> and I mean that sincerely. To, to me, beauty, the artwork is, can be a marriage of, of beauty and, and concept. And with, without, um, when, when we create something with, uh, without concept, Creation uh, can be just merely decorative, and uh, without um, without beauty, then we're just or without creation, 
number one, we wind up in the realm of thought. I have a very uh, interesting quote from, <laughs> I seated ugliness on my knee and almost immediately I grew tired of it. And that's by Salvador Dali. And I find it really, to me, it, it made a lot of sense. When I look at paintings like, like Guernica, for instance, here was uh, the most, one of the most famous political paintings, anti-war paintings, about a sp specific incident, as we, all, as we all know this painting. And yet, it, it's beautiful. It doesn't turn us away, it doesn't repulse us. If we use aggressiveness, if we use um, violence to talk about violence or hideousness or, or aggression to talk about aggression or, or you know, the tough things going on in the world today, um, without an element of a beauty to it, people just turn away, especially now with the 24-hour news channels, things like this. We, we've all seen so much uh, horror that it's more subversive to use beauty to get people's attention, to draw one in, and then uh, give them some information. I did, a, I did a, a photograph a few years back. I was really appalled at what was going on in Africa with the gold mines and how people were, were investing so much during the crash in gold. And these gold mines were uh, expanding, and the, the cost of inhumanity was, uh, was unbelievable. It was a, giant humanitarian crisis, you know, people just dying, building these, these mines. Uh, you can see from outer space, it's also a giant environmental crisis. And I called it the Rape of Africa, and I based it on Botticelli's Venus and Mars. And Botticelli was really onto something that is still relevant today. Here's a god of war with all of his spoils, of, of his gold beside him, and these three satyrs, and then there's uh, Venus, on the other hand, the goddess of beauty, and they're sort of uh, post-coital, and I, I, I re-envisioned this picture with Naomi Campbell uh, playing sort of mother, you know, playing Africa, as it was done in historical paintings. Uh, there was, sometimes they were used f women to represent the continents. And I was really, ups you know, wanting to talk about this, this, this concept and using uh, this Botticelli as sort of a template and wanting to, to modernize it with this photograph and get people's attention and look at it. But I couldn't, you know, there was a critic in Los Angeles, he was, he was very upset, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, offended by this picture that you could use Naomi Campbell to represent Africa. To, to, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Africa, and I've been there, and I know what it's like, and, and how could you uh, use this fashion model? And, well, I had many reasons. Number, you know, in my mind, first of all, when I shot the picture, you know, Botticelli used Simonetta Vespucci, who was a famous beauty in her day um, in, in Italy, an aristocrat, um, and he was in love with her, the legend goes, and that was who he painted. So I, I picked a, f a famous beauty of our day, Naomi, to represent Africa, and I said to him, you know, would you look at this picture longer if she had scars on her and flies and, uh, you know, a distended belly, if, if this woman was, you know, I think that's the job of the photojournalist. What I was trying to do is draw people into this photograph and then from, from there, tell them something. And I think using beauty as a tool is, is, is more subversive. It's, it's more difficult to do that. And it, it is more challenging. And we do live in a, in a, in a very, a world full of horrors and, and now everyone can videotape them. So when there's a tsunami, we're seeing it, you know, 500 different videotapes of it because everyone now has a, a phone with the camera on it. So we're being inundated with Im images of horror. And if we want to talk about the horrors of the world or, 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 or the tragedies of the world or, or anything of, 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 of this kind of deep nature, we must employ beauty to, to capture one's attention because people will just turn away. And, and they'll grow, they grow tired of it because we're weary of it already. Um, so I believe that beauty is a tool and married with concept um, we can create a, a piece of art that that will last through the ages and and stay with us how much more time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> you have four minutes and okay. 21 four seconds minutes. <laughs> 20 now <laughs>
if I could turn back time. <laughs> um, and sorry. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I also think you can look at the example of Jericho and the Raft of Medusa. Um, there was a specific incident, we, we all know this painting, and the incident was horrific. And yet this, this painting caused sort of a scandal at the time too because he has almost aestheticized uh, a tragic event and people were kind of upset about that, that he had used uh, these sort of figures in this uh, sort of Renaissance poses and people were offended but they were also it brought very much attention uh, I'm, I'm telling them I'm talking um, <laughs> through three minutes left uh, it brought a lot of attention to this very very important event and without those aesthetics that painting would have been forgotten today and yet we're still reminded of this event by the painting hanging in the, at the Louvre because of its beauty and its magnitude um, yes beauty is a weapon um, and if used properly, you can you can really lure people in, and and once you have their attention, you can you can tell them something. And there's something about a, a human beings that we are drawn to beauty, and there's no denying that. We all know ugly when we hear it. When someone's singing off key, uh, John Lennon song, we cringe, right? But that's an, a kind of a universal ugliness. But in the visual arts, it's much more subtle, but we all know that why are our film stars beautiful throughout the ages? Since there's been cinema w with uh, Garbo, Dietrich, up to you know Angelina Jolie today, because we like looking at beautiful examples of our of ourselves, of our, of other human beings. Something about that pleases us. So we can't deny the fact that a blue sky and and, and green trees gives us a sense of beauty or wonderment or even the sublime. Um, and I think that's part of being human. So to, to deny that, I think, is to deny part of um, what makes us human. That beauty is something that we are drawn to, and as artists, we can use it to, uh, to get a message across. Thank, Thank you. you. Trying, trying to find a better noise. <laughs> Thank you. F we have, of course, we're presenting the artists first. And uh, speaking against the motion, art should be beautiful, the most beautiful artist, Ming Wong, please. Good evening, Hong Kong. Can you hear me? Okay. 各位嘉賓,我好開心,翻來香港見大家. Now, as Lars has described, the motion of today's debate is taken from a title of a performance art piece by, uh, by Marina Abramovich from 1975. The full title is Art Must Be Beautiful, Artists must be beautiful. Now, I want to share with you what a friend told me. He's an expatriate who came here to live and work in Hong Kong. He said, Hong Kong is totally captivating. She is like a woman in an expensive fur coat, but underneath she wears dirty knickers. <laughs> so, today I will try and show you how that woman is a work of art, not because of her beautiful, expensive uh, coat, but the truth <laughs> that lies down below. <laughs> I believe, as an artist, I, I think art's fundamental purpose is to offer new ways of looking at the world, to give us fresh perspectives on what is happening around us. 
I have nothing against beauty. In fact, I use beauty in my work. There is a lot of beauty in my work, but it cannot stop there. It cannot stop at beauty. <laughs> it's not good enough to give us what we already know and what we already love for something to be deemed as art. It has to go beyond surface decoration. It has to go beyond distraction. And it has to go beyond drag. <laughs> it has to go beyond fetishism and commodification. Art has to go beyond beauty. And for me, art is life. Life is art. And this is why I'm in this get up today, here tonight for the debate. But I would like to come back to Marina Abramovich's seminal work from 1975, Art Must Be Beautiful, Artists Must Be Beautiful. In that video, as Lars has described, she combs her hair with one comb in one hand and she brushes her hair with a brush with the other hand over and over again and she keeps repeating, Art Must Be Beautiful, Artists Must Be Beautiful. And she keeps doing it until she destroys her hair and face. For me, the most interesting part of the video, because that is what we have left of that performance from 1975, is when she is scratching her face with a comb and brush such that she pulls her eyes and she, to me she becomes suddenly like a, she has slitty eyes and she's become like a, a, an inscrutable oriental. And at once dangerous, ugly, or beautiful, or treacherous. She, and at that point, there are, uh, it reminds me of dr the Dragon Lady, of Anna Mei Wong, and of Susie Wong, and of Ming Wong. <laughs> that art, that piece of artwork, to me, is like a mirror. It holds up. What does it hold up to me? This is when I get confused. What does it hold up? And it, is it to me or which part of me? And that's when, that's when it works. For me, that is when it becomes a very good piece of art. Um, and of course, when you watch this video and when you see her, she looks, she looks a bit like Maria Callas. Mar uh, Marina is a very, very, beautiful woman. But what you might not see in a video is the fact that she did this in 1975 uh, before an audience of 300 people in Copenhagen and she was naked and she bared everything for the audience. Now, I'm, I'm going to quote uh, uh, I'm going to quote Marina who talked about this piece of work of hers. The piece, Art Must Be Beautiful, Artist Must Be Beautiful, is really about this image of art that should be beautiful. The idea that the painting should fit the colors of the carpet in the living room, which I think was so wrong because in my point of view, the art have to be disturbing. Art have to be a prediction of the future. Art have to ask questions. Art have to be so many things, but beautiful or not beautiful, it is not important. Have to be true. Unquote. So what is, what is true? What is true? I'm an artist and I don't usually do public speaking and, and, and I usually make art to express myself. So for me, this debate and my presence here is like a work of art. It's like a performance. And I'm trying to find out what the truth is. Do you want to know what the truth is? Okay.
Simon. <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me all put you at ease immediately. I will, <laughs> I will not be trying to emulate <laughs> our fantastic uh, Ming Wong. But I do agree with my opponent on the other side of this debate that art is life, life is art, and I happen to think that despite everything, life is beautiful, therefore art is beautiful. Art must be beautiful, and I know that we are the underdogs here tonight, David LaChapelle and myself. I have made the, the um, calculation here. We have, as we've heard, 90 undecided people here tonight, and even if those 90 are, of course, going to swing to David's and my side of the argument, we still will only get to 226 uh, uh, people in favor of Art is Beautiful. So uh, we will have to really go quite a long way to sway you onto the other side. Now You're going to have to um, take it off. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I am Swiss, and uh, we don't like taking sides in a debate. We like to be... Uh, <laughs> we like to be neutral. So uh, when Amelie and Jana asked me, uh, would I uh, consider participating in this debate, I said, yes, I want to be the moderator. And, <laughs> and so... They answered, no, 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 that can't be the case because we have Lars Nitve, and Lars Nitve has to be the moderator. And I must say, I fully agree with them. We could not have a better moderator than Lars Nitve. So this being said, I then said, well, um, you decide on which side of the argument you want to put me. And so the answer came very clearly. You have to be on the artist beautiful side. And then I started thinking, uh, I think what we all have in common in this room, otherwise we wouldn't be here in the first place, is that we all love art. I mean, we at least agree on that point. Uh, we all have a passion for art. That's the engine in our lives. It certainly is the, is the engine in my life. I do what I do uh, purely because I'm obsessed with art. And I always say that if you love candies, there are no better place to work than in a candy store. And uh, so... Uh, when I think about all the art that I love and that excites me, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it, it can either be stirring uh, when I look at a piece of art, it can be sensual, it can be pretty, it can be disturbing, it can be challenging, it can be stunning, it can be interrogating, it can be humorous, it can be sad, it can be poetic, it can be romantic, it can be cold, but all the artworks that I either love or uh, madly want to possess or madly wish I could at least uh, have them uh, be under my gavel uh, are works that I love. And uh, at the end of the day, that's the common denominator between all those works. And therefore, uh, and now uh, all of these works, I love them. And all of these works, I do find them beautiful. They could not be more different one from another, uh, whether you go from a very cold work, a very purely geometric work, right to the other extreme, to a highly expressionist work, uh, you can find beauty in all of them. You can find beauty in art of any culture, from any origin. And I love going to museums or to collections without knowing anything in advance about what I'm going to see, without being prepared in any way about what I'm going to be seen. And very often, Often, I much prefer to see the work of a contemporary artist first without the artist. I want to see the work. I want the work to speak for itself. And then if I like it, then I will do my homework. Then I will get into it. And then uh, it may elicit the desire to meet the artist who has done the work. But the outset, it's really the artwork that is there. And uh, when we spend our time in museums, uh, we don't have the privilege of having the artist standing next to it. And... Uh, when I look at all of these works, 
the one common denominator is they are beautiful because we find beauty in so many different ways of artistic expression. I'm as obsessed about uh, music that I am about art and we all have an instant reaction when we see first a work of art. It's an immediate instant uh, reaction. My approach to art is purely physical and so uh, you react to a work of art in the same way that you react to a person. Uh, you cannot explain when you meet a person either you're phenomenally attracted or you may feel exactly the other way around or you may feel totally indifferent because all of us we have auras, we all have an energy that we exude, all of us have uh, an appeal on some, uh, uh, we, we, uh, on others not at all and it is that energy that we exude that we find in the artworks themselves. I have so often seen that it's artworks that choose their collectors and not the other way around. I remember a collector who went to the Zurich Museum and he madly, madly fell in love with a uh, painting there. And so he went to the director of the museum and he said, I have to have this painting. I have to acquire it. Please give me the name of the owner of this work. And then the director said, no, I'm very, very sorry. I can't tell you. I'm not allowed. This is confidential. However, if you want to, write a letter and I will send it to the owner of this work. So he did that uh, and gave the letter to the museum director and never, ever got an answer. And uh, so he thought, well, that didn't work. And seven years later, he was in a different city. Suddenly, was, there was a tremendous thunderstorm that uh, erupted. And he just happened to stand in front of a jeweler. And so in order to come and uh, protect himself from the uh, rain, he walked into the jeweler's store and started to chat to the jeweler. And then the jeweler told him, where do you come from? And he said, I come from Zurich. And uh, then he said, oh, that's interesting. I lent one of my paintings uh, seven years ago to the museum. And in fact, I had this crazy guy who wrote me a letter uh, <laughs> that he wanted to, uh, that he loved my work so much and that he wanted to uh, acquire this work from my collection. And then the guy said, well, that was me. So he was in such a, a shock that he immediately agreed to sell him the work. And so the transaction happened. And so often, uh, you may think I'm completely nutty and you're not wrong, but uh, so often <laughs> I see that this is the case, that you see that the, the artworks exude energy. Now, uh, when we love somebody, when we, we all think uh, the person we love is the most beautiful person in the world. And we mentioned earlier the, the young boy in the death in Venice, the most beautiful boy in the world. Uh, uh, my great hero in life is Prince, the musician, the genius from Minneapolis. And uh, his most stunning song uh, ever written, and one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of music ever written, is called You Must Be the Most Beautiful Girl in the World. And uh, when you love, you love somebody uh, for their inner beauty just as much as for their exterior beauty. You love the whole thing. And in fact, very often perfection can be very boring, can be off-putting. It has happened to all of us of meeting wonderfully attractive people and then somehow the uh, fascination wears off very, very quickly. It can happen the same thing with art. You may acquire a work of art that has instant appeal and you may see that after uh, three days the most, you don't want to live with that artwork any longer. Uh, and the contrary, you may love somebody uh, for their little imperfections, if they have some, it, it, for their little defaults, if they have some. And there is great beauty in those imperfections. There's great beauty in these defaults. And so at the end of the day, uh, if you say, does art have to be stirring? Not necessarily. Does art have to be sensual? It can be, but not necessarily. Does art have to be pretty? It can occasionally be. Does art have to be disturbing? It, it doesn't have to be, but it can occasionally be. Does art have to be challenging? Yes, sometimes, um, as we've just seen. Uh, does art have to be interrogating? Uh, does art have to be humorous? Yes, it can be sometimes. Does art have to be sad? And yes, sometimes uh, uh, the greatest art uh, is sad. Why has no comedy ever won an Oscar? Uh, and my final, final question is, does art have to be beautiful? And the answer is yes! <laughs>